Hello everyone, welcome back. This is 1-7 basic circuits, pulse extenders, multipliers and clocks in the compact resistance series. I'm Amir Chen22 and as the title suggests, we'll talk about pulse extenders, multipliers and clocks. And for the clock session, I'll also introduce uh, uncontrolled clocks and controlled clocks, both of them. So without further ado, let's get started. So what do we define as a pulse extender? Well, it basically refers to circuits, a circuit that extends the pulse length of the input pulse. So very simple. So here we see sort of an example for this. I will show a lot of circuits related to these. So the first one is just simply using an additional repeater here. And we have a stone button here. So this resonant dust will turn on this lamp. This vortex will also power the lamp. And this means that this entire circuit will extend the powering of the redstone lamp by vortex due to this vortex repeater. Like so. So if I remove the vortex, it would turn off a bit faster. If I place it back, it will turn off a bit slower. So. That's literally a very simple pulse extender. Another one, well, you can chain repeaters, of course. So here I use a wooden button instead because of the delay. So it works. And yet yeah, by chaining these repeaters here, so you just add four ticks for each repeater at maximum. You can obviously adjust the delay if you want to. But then here I'll just use Vortex to demonstrate the effect clear. So yeah, and just to make sure, you need to have your input pulse to be longer than a, a, a stone button because here you have one tick here, but then here you have 12 ticks in total. So there is a delay of 11 ticks. So a stone button wouldn't be able to cover the delay, but a wooden button would. So yeah. Uh, make sure that you have enough input pulse length for your delay circuit if you're planning on using repeater chaining. Another method, well, we can take from a short pulse actually, we don't necessarily have to take from a long pulse like a stone button or wood button, which might in some cases be a bit more impractical. Here's a more practical one. So for example, we can take a forward tick repeater pulse and then we just send it through two vortex repeaters with a chain like this and then with a resonant dust just being powered by all of these three vortex repeaters. This will also power the lamp and it's still a pulse extender as a result. So yeah, uh, the reason for having this vortex to power this resonant line is of course because this vortex repeater will only power this resonant line for vortex so we need this vortex to immediately power this resonant line to continue the powering or else if say we have this instead then you would see it would turn off and turn back on again so that's not what we want we want the pulse to be consistent so yeah and let me introduce a more special one. This is probably a bit more popular. This is a pulse extender using comparators. It works by using the decreasing signal strength. So when I press the button, you see it turns on. And for a brief moment, it will turn on and turn back off. So yeah. And you can also notice that these two lamps turn off at different times. That makes sense because this red stone dust turns off later than this redstone dust because this redstone dust receives one less signal strength so this lamp is supposed to turn off faster than this redstone lamp you can always analyze this uh, a bit more in detail yourself but uh, i'm just going to tell you the result here and it can also be better demonstrated here and you can see that First off, what the difference between this one and this one is that this uses 4 dust here, while this uses 3 dust. So the decreasing in signal strength only occurs in these two resonant dusts. While for this setup, it has these two resonant dusts as well as these two resonant dusts. So you can expect that this 
pulse extender is going to turn off faster than this one. Moreover, where you input the uh, for, for the pulse extender is also deterministic because if I input it from here you can see this turn off and then this turn off and while I input it from here not only is the pulse shorter but both will turn off instantly well not instantly they will turn off, turn off at the same time so yeah uh, you basically have to make sure whether if it is your preference to have a shorter pulse shorter extended pulse or not and you also need to check which input position you want to have your pulse extender as. So yeah, just some minor details. Although uh, I don't think it's quite important for starters, but then it's important to uh, know that, I guess, it, when you get to a bit more advanced in Redstone. But yeah, anyways, uh, let me show more. So this is a modified Evo Hopper clock. So you, why is it uh, modified? Is because uh, for a regular Evo Hopper clock, you would have both these two pistons as sticky pistons. But here I just use one sticky piston and then and another one as normal. So if I flick this here, you can see it does that. And then after a while, we'll push it back and then retract. And then this will turn off. Now, the pulse length determine, is determined by how many items you place in the hopper. So if I say I'm going to place four items, then this is going to be a shorter pulse. You can already see that. So yeah, you can obviously fill it to the brim, but then I'm not going to waste time on that. So yeah, and um, each item is going to add. Uh, in this setup, at uh, uh, eight eight ticks, and you can also notice that you can also take an output from this resident block. Actually, this will half the pulse length. So each item you add will only add four ticks as a result. So yeah, um, another technique you can use is sand, because sand, uh, well, the second one. Like after the first sand falls, the second one will have a delay before falling, and also for the third one. So the accumulative delay actually makes sand a good pulse extender. So this is a one tick, and then you can see this is going to power more than a one tick. You can verify this by having this as a sticky piston, and if it's a one tick, it should spit out the block. But here it doesn't, so it definitely has an extended pulse. So yeah, these are some of the basic pulse extenders. Now I'm not going to say that you're going to use them for a lot, but then it's still sometimes useful in some occasions. Although mostly we are going to rely a lot more on short pulses rather than needing to extend long pulses, and um. To be honest, I didn't include all of the um, extend uh, pulse extenders here. There are still some other techniques, but those are going to be introduced a bit later. But yeah, anyways, this is going to sum up the pulse extender section. I'll go on to the pulse multiply section. So what is the pulse multiply then? It refers to a circuit that produces more than one pulse given a pulse input. So here I have four circuits here, they look very alike. So this uses a piston base, notice that it is a piston base, if you're going to detect the piston head it actually doesn't work. This one is a resident lab, this is a 3 tick, this is a 4 tick. So you can see two poses here, two poses here, two poses here, and two poses here. So very nice. These are the basic pulse multiplies and you're going to use them for a lot. Now all these four tiny circuits actually have some difference in the pulse difference. So okay let me talk about what I mean by pulse difference. It's basically uh, the pulse, uh, sorry, the time uh, between the start of the two pulses. So for this setup here, the pulse difference is 2 ticks. 
for these two setups is 3.6 and for this setup is 4.6. So yeah, uh, depending on your need, you're going to use different uh, components for these four. So one of them would probably be suitable. If it's not suitable, then you're going to use other types, I guess, in which one of them is actually in the exercise, you would attempt to build one of them. But yeah, anyways, I'll go on to introduce more sand circuits, because why not? This is also a nice trick. This has the exact same effect as this one, actually. And we also have this. Uh, this one, the pulse difference is actually 5 ticks, if I'm not wrong. So, yeah. A bit more special. So, usually you only get up to 4 ticks, but then with this setup, you can get 5 ticks. So, yeah, pretty nice. And besides these uh, pulse multipliers, which multiplies the pulse for both edges. Why well, I say both edges. But, yeah, anyway. We also have some uh, conditional pulse multipliers. So this would be corresponding to a rising edge pulse multiplier. This would be a falling edge pulse multiplier. You can say that. But yeah, anyways. So what, what do I mean then? For the rising edge one, it basically multiplies the pulse during the rising edge, but not the falling edge. So here you can see, if I press the button, it's going to do two pulses, but on the falling edge, it only does one pulse. So I would say this is a rising edge pulse multiplier. Other people have the other names, I don't care. So yeah. Just let's, letting you know that you can have conditional multi pulse multipliers. So for this one, it's a falling edge one. So yeah, on the rising edge, it pulses once, but then for the falling edge, it pulses twice. So yeah, only the falling edge does it. the pulse get multiplied. So you can always introduce uh, different states for the pulse multipliers. And yeah, it would be useful in some circuits, I can tell you. But yeah, anyways. So actually, that's already all I wanted to say for my pulse multipliers. I would go on to clocks, in which you can see some flashy stuff here. So, what are clocks? They refer to circuits that can be turned on and off constantly, and clocks can be further classified into toggleable and non-toggleable clocks. So here I'll introduce the top the non-toggleable clocks first. So this is an observer clock and it has a two tick frequency because it would power anything here. Uh, so let's say the first powering is at zero tick, the second powering would be two ticks after. So I would say this as a two tick frequency, basically. We also have a repeater clock, which basically is the same as the observer clock, although you can always switch the delay for the repeater. And for this setup, it has a 2-tick frequency. For this setup, however, this is a torch and repeater clock. This has a 6-tick frequency, because the next time this dust line turns on, for example, would be 6 ticks after. So I would say this has a 6-tick frequency. So, yeah. It, it doesn't really matter for uh, beginners, to be honest. This is another clock. This is a hopper clock. It's just two hoppers facing each other. You only want to place one item inside them. And then we turn ourselves into this idiot of a hopper clock again. Now we have these two sticky pistons. And the items inside the hopper, the E4 hopper clock uh, can be varied. So, yeah, if you place more items, it's going to do its stuff slower. And yeah, so those are the main uh, clocks that I'll show you. Um, just a tangent. Uh, if you're going to play on some uh, multiplayer redstone servers, make sure not to have any running clocks like these. Because... Having these clocks would lag the server, and depending on the server rules, they can give you punishments for that. So make sure you 
um, always turn your clocks off if you intend to use them. So yeah, now I'll talk about, well, basically how you can turn it off, I guess. By introducing you toggleable clocks, they basically refer to clocks that can be turned off. Um, yeah, and as toggleable clocks can uh, are clocks that can be turned off, this means that uh, if you give the toggleable clock a suitable pulse, they will act as pulse multipliers. So they have a somewhat a relationship with uh, pulse multipliers. So here's an example. Actually, all of these four circuits. Uh, four clocks can be. Is it four? Yeah, four. Oh no, five. Anyway, actually, these five circuits can all be turned into toggleable clocks. So for this one, we just have a sticky piston retracting the subservicer. So, yeah, it's just that. And then for this one, we actually have an observer that triggers this clock, and then we also have a sticky piston that retracts the block such that the repeater cannot power this piston. Thus, so just like this. Yeah, pretty neat. For this one, we only need a resin torch to turn off this torch. It's as simple as that. So yeah, just like that. And then for the hopper clock case, we just need to lock one of the hoppers. So like that. And for the evil hopper clock, we just need to lock one of the pistons. Now, uh, I can tell you that this is not the way you use Evo Hopper Clock because Evo Hopper Clock is usually used in some other cases. Uh, this is just an extreme case where you can just place one item and then it, it will just do its stuff. But then we usually just use Hopper Clock if you want to make a uh, controllable or toggleable clock. So you might ask, when do we use a Evo, an Evo Hopper Clock? Well, there is. Um, it is basically used more widely as an entity spam input device. So, in case if you are, for example, again playing in a resto multiplayer server, you might realize that there will be some rule breakers that will try to spam your doors. This is not nice for your doors because they would break. And by having an evil hopper clock, for example, as a solution. If I spam this lever, it doesn't work because this piston is getting locked by this repeat, uh, comparator. So it cannot realize anything until all of the items are transferred to this hopper. And now when I turn it off, it turns off. And the same thing happens. This piston is also being locked by this comparator until all of the items from here transfers to here. So that is the f how, how the evil hopper clock functions, I guess. Also, another thing that I would like to talk about evil hopper clock is the working principle. You might realize from before that I have used a normal piston instead of a sticky piston. Now, some people might think, why do I do that? Well, because if Let's say here, I use a normal piston. If I power this, nothing happens. Guess why? This normal piston, well, it just retracts. And this block is not going to update this piston. Nothing updates this piston. And that's why when the normal piston retracts, it does not cause any update to this piston. Versus when the use of a sticky piston. The sticky piston would retract this redstone block, updating this sticky piston. And boom, it gets updated. So that's why we use two sticky pistons if we, if we want it to clock. And we use one normal piston on one side if we just want to uh, have a long pulse, so a pulse multiplier basically. So yeah, hopefully you understand a bit more. And again, 
uh, as same as the previous video, I'm going to tell you that there are some useful resources that you can refer to. It's the Minecraft Wiki's uh, Redstone Circus or Pulse page. The link is in the Word documents I provided you, in, which is also in the description below. But yeah, anyway, so that's basically all. Now I will go on to the exercises. The exercises for this time, some are easy, some are not so. I guess. So, yeah. Um, let me check on which exercise I want to talk a bit more. Okay, I guess we will start off with an easy one. So, exercise 7.2. So, we have a left model that generates two pulses to this piston. So, yeah. Okay, so. So question A asks for the name of the circuits from the input observer to the hopper. So essentially, these. This is the input observer. This is the hopper. So notice that this input observer provides only a one tick. So you need to consider the effects on of what it will do to this hopper. So that's what the question is asking. The second question is um, to state the name of the circuits from the input observer to the piston. So we are basically considering the entire circuit to this piston. So notice that this is an it, it, this is an input observer which only generates one pulse. You need to consider the effects to this piston and to answer the question correctly, I guess. And C is just a, a compacting uh, question. So you need to base on the exact delay of this and to make it the same in this module as well. So that is the uh, for ex exercise 7.2. And then, uh, okay, I will talk a bit more about exercise. 7.4. 7.4, actually both 7.4 and 7.3 require some analytical skills, which isn't actually too complicated because I would guide you through by using the sub-questions. So I'll, I'll just take exercise 7.4 as an example. So we have E4 hopper clocks, yay, because I like them. So, we see that the left module has 18 snowballs and 2 cyan wall. The right module has 23 snowballs and 2 cyan wall. So, uh, the left corresponds to 4 signal strength, the right cons corresponds to 5 signal strength. So, A is just similar to exercise 7.2, not going to mention too much about that. B is literally just an obser observation question. So, like how many pulses does the front? Uh, this is the front. How many pulses does the front piston receive and how many pulses does the back piston receive? So that is sub-question B. Sub-question C is literally just asking for the right module, the same question again. So just observe and you would get the results. So these are pretty simple. And consider both modules now. So this is just asking the general trend. So how does the signal strain correlate to the number of pulses received by the pistons? And you don't have to use any mathematical formula because I'll ask you that later. So yeah, you can just you just you just need to identify the general trend on the effects of signal strength to the number of pulses to the piston. So that's what this question is asking. And I assume that people who watch my videos are at least fifth graders and because this question and requires some basic algebra but then I'm sure that people who watch my videos are at least with grades <laughs> so yeah uh, here I will ask you to provide a mathematical expression or for the number of pulses received by the front and back pistons respectively with a variable signal strength we denote it as n and n will take integer numbers from 1 to 14 so yeah uh, 
and then I would tell you to determine the number of pulses received by the front and back pistons respectively when n equals 7. So basically just use the formula you derived from sub-question E. And then there are two, there are three more sub-questions. Yes, three more. These sub-questions are a bit more complicated um, due to the knowledge, the required knowledge of um, hopper ROMs basically, or dropper hopper circuits. And yeah, this will be introduced further in a later video. I think it should be um, 2-7 dropper hopper circuits. I think, at least. So yeah, you can, all, you can check the video out uh, if you want to, to complete these questions. I'll also probably include this question into 2007 the exercises so yeah don't worry so if in case if you don't know how to do them it's fine but yeah just for fun and yeah uh, this also quite frankly has the most sub questions out of all of the exercises nine sub questions yes I like it and then let me see if this one has yeah okay so this one it is also a bit more challenging unless you are very experienced and you already know what you're doing. Otherwise, you're going to do a lot of trial by er trial and errors. So basically, build a circuit to make this piston worm go from here to here, and then from here back to here. I give you some hints. The hint is that the circuit requires eight pulses to work, and one of the possible solutions is to use toggleable core and make sure the frequency allows the sticky pistons to reach position A and go back to the original position. And I can tell you a bit more, you want a faster clock. That's all the hints I will give you. And good luck with the exercises. As always, the answers will be at the back, so you can always refer to it. And for word answers, all of them will be provided in a separate word file, which I'll also include in along with the world download. So you can always check the link out. And yeah, uh, I hope you enjoy the exercises and learn a bit more from it. And yeah, thanks for watching. I'll see you in uh, 1-8. Basic circuits, piston extender circuits. See you there.